The radical left see no positives from British colonisation, no positives from modernisation. They reject European history and values completely. They fantasise about some kind of indigenous utopia and eco-heaven that apparently existed before colonisation. It's a complete nonsense. Normal everyday Australians called them out on that in the referendum by voting no to the terrible idea of creating a two-tiered political system. When they don't get their own way by peaceful means, they start threatening about not being very peaceful anymore. Their self-righteous entitlement is off the charts. And what we're seeing is a tantrum of narcissists. After a week of the noisiest silence I think I've ever heard, we get a bizarre statement from a subset of the subset. Not even all the radicals were on board with this one. It was signed by nobody, really, but purporting to be a statement of yes leaders, organisations and community members, basically slinging more hate and accusations of racism, ignorance and lying at no voters. So what did it say? This statement said it was now clear that no constitutional change recognising Indigenous Australians would ever succeed. It talked about the occupation of an Australia that belonged to Indigenous people. It said we do not for one moment accept that this country is not ours. Well nobody said the country isn't yours, it's just that it's not only yours anymore. Nobody has come forward to put their name to this statement, which makes me wonder why the news media, any of us, are even giving it the time of day. But it was posted online Sunday night by the Aboriginal activist Alira Davis. And it went on to say that it is the, quote, legitimacy of the non-Indigenous occupation in this country that requires recognition, not the other way around. Our sovereignty has never been ceded. Well, I hope this really does wake some people up to the dangers that lurk behind performative ceremonies like the Welcome to Country. These are not just nice things to do, nice token symbolism. They're a deliberate attempt to weaken the sense of entitlement that non-Indigenous Australians feel that they have to this country. I think it's time for a little truth-telling of our own now. The wars of colonisation or occupation, call it whatever you like, between the English and the Aborigines of the 18th and early 19th centuries have been fought. They're over. The English actually won. In the subsequent 200 years, that's seven or eight generations, Australia has grown into a nation of 27 million people of many and varied cultures and histories. This nation certainly belongs to all of us not just those whose ancestors happened to tread the land first historically. And the country also belongs to all of us since we adopted the British rule of law and property rights 200 years ago. And as far as I know, there isn't anyone walking around alive today who's much over 105 years old. Some more truth telling. Aboriginal Australians are among the luckiest and most privileged so-called First Nations people on the planet when it comes to opportunity. We have shifted plenty in the direction of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, UNDRIP. Not that we have to consider that a standard, by the way. We as Australians have never voted on it. And if we will determine, sorry, we will determine our own standards for our own country, thank you. But Aboriginal Australians live in one of the world's most egalitarian liberal democracies, thanks to the British systems that the nation was founded under and the work done by all of us, including Aboriginal Australians, with different ancestors since. This nation has seen people come here from other impoverished and war-torn countries and grow to build lives full of richness of all kinds because of our systems, because of our kindness, our Judeo-Christian values and our strong sense of fairness compassion and goodwill. We spend double the amount of taxpayer money per head on Australians who claim to be Indigenous than non-Indigenous. Double. Let that sink in. So if I were an Aboriginal Australian mourning the referendum result, I'd be asking myself a few questions. So in response to your letter of 12 points, anonymous Aboriginal leaders who don't actually represent Aboriginal people but are just a bunch of lefties and communists, here's six questions for you to consider. Firstly, what people on earth do not have a bloody history and gross injustice in their ancestry and have had to learn to let it go, look forward and build lives of peace and prosperity? Secondly, 
While we acknowledge the bad things about colonisation, what are the benefits that have been brought to all of us by European colonisation of this land in the late 18th century? Where would we be now if it hadn't happened? Thirdly, what are the benefits that have come specifically from British European colonisation compared to other possible European, Middle Eastern or Asian colonisers? Fourthly, what might have happened to us in World War I and World War II had it not been for the defence of the Anzacs and our own Aboriginal ancestors who were themselves Anzacs? Fifthly, what appreciation have I shown lately for the generosity of the Australian government in terms of the fact that on average we get double the share of the pie that non-Indigenous Aussies do per capita? And finally, the sixth thing that I think these Aboriginal left-wing so-called leaders should ask themselves, here's a question for the educated and well-off middle-class socialist leaders of that, uh, that group. What have I done lately to help myself and to help other people of all races have a happy, better, healthier and wealthier life in this wonderful country that is modern Australia? How have I contributed to Australian society and community and business in a meaningful and constructive way. Taking the focus off me, me, me and take, take, take and putting it onto others and giving.